All right. Let me just check my microphone. Is it picking me up? Oh, it looks like it's picking me up. Okay, good. All right. Oh, good. A bunch of people are already here. You folks are on time. Glad to see it. All right. Well, I guess I might as well go ahead. I don't think I need to wait for late covers. So we're here in this class. Uh, this is the main web page here for the class. We have been through more than half of it. And we're down to the finishing chapter five. Just a few more to go. Let me just move things off my screen as much as possible. And here's the communications and network security, which is what we're up to. So uh, here's network architecture and design. This is more of the network plus review, essentially. So uh, at layer one, you got the cables, and there are defects with the cables that can happen. Electromagnetic interference is when radio signals leak out of one cable into another. Uh, one common type is crosstalk, where one wire leaks into another. This is common when you have Ethernet cables and you untwist too much of them at the end, so they're running parallel. Another problem is attenuation, which weakens the signal as it travels further from the source. Usually not a significant issue for digital transmissions. But what matters for fiber optic transmissions. So twisted pair cabling is the most common type. Unshielded twisted pair is the cheapest and most common. Four pairs of cables, four pairs of wires. One wire in each pair is a ground, and they're twisted a different number of turns per inch so that all the crosstalk will tend to cancel out. Uh, there are various categories of it which vary in the number of turns per inch and have different speeds. Of course, this speed is easy to misunderstand. All cables work on a distance bandwidth product. <coughs> so if you have a short cable, you can run any amount of data through it. The only rating here is how much data you can run through it at the maximum length, which for Ethernet is typically 100 meters. Anyway. Um, these days, most people seem to have Cat 5e or Cat 6, and you can carry anything up to gigabit Ethernet on them, and even 10 gigabit Ethernet for short distances. So, shielded twisted pair is what you get if you are worried about radio signals coming in from the outside because you're in some place like a factory or some place with electric motors or fluorescent lights that are emitting a lot of radio noise. This just puts a tinfoil sheath around the cable to protect it from electromagnetic interference from the outside. If you really want interference-free cable, you get coaxial, not ethernet. This has one conductor down the middle and a braided sheath around the outside, and it is carefully adjusted to be the right distance from the center to form a perfect cylinder, and that makes a waveguide that causes certain frequencies to travel down it very efficiently. And this is why it's used for cable TV and cable modems to move internet service around. Fiber optic is by far the best transmission medium. It is essentially perfect. You can move traffic around the whole world with it, and people have done it. Uh, it carries enormous amounts of bandwidth. Single mode fiber optic can carry up to 100 terabits per second down a single strand, although the electronics to create and receive that signal is very expensive, and most people prefer to use cheaper electronics and more cables. But anyway, completely immune to electromagnetic interference because it is not electrical signals traveling through the wire. It is pulses of infrared light. Multimode fiber is the cheapest kind to use because the core is large, 50 or 62 and a half microns. So you can use cheap LED light sources to send and receive and uh, cheap silicon receivers. The problem is the light can go crooked down the cable, bouncing off the sides, and that causes it to smear out so these things cannot send a high bandwidth signal as far as single mode fiber, which has a core of, uh, I think, five or six microns, so small that only there's only one possible path for the infrared light to go down it, and the light does not spread out uh, appreciably at all, even over miles of transmission, so all the large steps of internet traffic going from one city to another or one continent to another 
um, are carried by fiber optics, which is the cheapest way to move a lot of data a long distance. And once you have dug a trench and laid 100 miles of fiber, it is, of course, very expensive to dig another trench and lay more fiber. So it's desirable to get as most the maximum amount of benefit out of the existing fiber. And to do that with wavelength division multiplexing, where you send multiple data streams through the same fiber. And at the power levels used for these things, even telephony, which uses high power signals, the you are within the linear region of the fiber, so multiple different infrared colors can go through the same fiber without interacting with each other, and they can get above 10 gigabits per second going through the fiber, even quite a lot higher with dense wavelength division multiplexing. That's how you move data on the LAN to get a long distance from one city to another, but on your local area network in your building or on the campus of your company, you use short range cables that are much cheaper and faster. Uh, Ethernet was originally a bus topology with coaxial cables. All modern versions use star topology, which just did care cables, one cable per device. This is a baseband technology. Um, one computer is connected to one cable and it has complete use of all the bandwidth in that cable. It is not sharing with other devices. Uh, and if you have hubs on your network, which are very old and not used much, then frames can collide because two nodes can try to transmit simultaneously, and the Ethernet protocol has ways of handling that. So here's the types of Ethernet, 10 base 2 and 10 base 5 are very old technologies, almost never seen anymore with coaxial bases. Now everybody uses pretty much 100 base T or 1000 base T, uh, 100 megabit per second or 1000 megabit per second Ethernet, always in a star. Uh, topology. So the Ethernet protocol has this system, carrier sends multiple access, collision detection. This works because an Ethernet network sends a signal down the wire which has almost no attenuation. So you know what the voltage should be. And in a simple case, which is a little simpler than the way modern Ethernet actually works, <coughs> you could imagine that a zero bit is a zero voltage and a one bit is a five volt voltage. And if that were true, then if two transmissions, if two devices sent at the same time and the signals overlapped, you would go up to 10 volts. So that's how CSMA CD works. It looks for a voltage outside the expected range, which is not expected to come from a normal signal with the amount of noise that will be around, but it proves that something has collided. So that's how it detects collisions. Then it sends a jamming signal to tell everybody to shut up and retransmit at a random time later to try to avoid the collision. That's how it works. So it jams, waits again, retransmits. And this is why Ethernet networks are kind of a ripoff like wood, where they tell you it's a two by four, but it's not really two inches by four inches. If you have a 100 megabit per second Ethernet network and a hub, you can only get up to about 50 megabits per second of transmission or 25 in a normal uh, network with many people using it at once before the collisions slow it down drastically. So you cannot really get the full value out of it, except if there's just one client and one server, or if you're using switches, which avoid these collisions by separating the traffic properly. On wireless networks, because the signal shrinks as the square of the distance from the antenna, you cannot detect collisions because if a signal, you cannot say how big a voltage should be. If you're next to the antenna, the voltage is big. If you move away, it falls to a much smaller level. So there is no forbidden range of voltage. So instead, you have to use carrier sense multiple access collision avoidance. So wireless networks have a different reason why they run far below the rated speed. You have to spend a lot of time arguing about who's going to talk next. First, you have to send a clear to send signal. Everybody shut up. I'm about to speak. Then you send, then you have to have a layer two acknowledgement. Did you get that? Okay, now someone else can talk. And all that arguing back and forth means, again, you typically get less than half of the rated speed in terms of actual data moving from one machine to another. All the rest of the speed is uh, bandwidth is used up by the devices arguing among themselves about who's going to talk next and retransmitting frames, which get damaged uh, by interference from other frames, which happens a lot on wireless networks. The older systems were ArcNet, a really old one, I ran at two and a half megs. Token Ring was another one that became popular at campuses a few decades ago. 
uh, used two rings of fiber optics, and the idea was this meant the signal could go clockwise or counterclockwise, so you could have one cut in the fiber ring, and it would be what they call self-healing. It would still be able to send data uh, between all the devices by sending it in the other direction to go around the cut. These both used tokens, so they did not have any issue of collisions. There's a token going around the ring saying, it is your turn to speak. If you have something to say, attach it to the token. Wait until it gets where it's going. Then the token is empty again, and one more person can speak. So these networks didn't have collisions. And if they tell you you have 16 megs, you can really send 16 megs of real data. There's no significant overhead. But these technologies were more expensive and lost in the marketplace, and Ethernet replaced them. The sloppier technique turned out to be the most cost-effective. FIDI was another technology with two fiber rings, um, and again, fault tolerant. And it ran at 100 megabits per second, which was considered pretty fast a couple decades ago. All right, your network has to have some kind of physical layout between the devices. Uh, this was the early network. You would have a fiber optic, or I mean a, a coaxial bus going across the ceiling, and each machine would have a tap coming from that single cable. And if the cable was broken, it would bring the whole network down. These are almost never used anymore on local area networks. Um, although they are, does, this does happen uh, if you buy T1 lines to connect company locations in a city, you can actually have an effective bus network. This is what you typically have in a uh, company intranet that spans multiple company locations or multiple buildings. You have a sort of series of trees that are connected at a higher level with a sort of hierarchy. Um, and a ring is how token ring and FIDI worked. Each device would talk to the one next to it, and so you have the data going around in a ring. But this is the most popular technology used by far. You have a switch or a hub in the room, and every device has its own wire connected to the switch or hub that they share exclusive use of. This is nice because if one cable breaks, it only affects one device. But of course, if that switch in the middle breaks, they're all off the network. But anyway, this is called a star topology. Token ring actually used a physical star, but a logical ring, even though the cables were connected in a star, it moved this token from point to point from one computer to the next one, so the data moved as if it was connected in a ring. And of course, a mesh is essentially what you have on the internet. You have a partial mesh. A full mesh is what you see on the left when every device has a direct cable to every other device, and that is the most tolerant, but of course, the most fault tolerant, but the most expensive. A few of those cables can break, and you'll still be able to find a way to move data from one machine to the next. But what most uh, real internet is, is a partial mesh, where there are quite a few devices that have more than one pass to get somewhere, but they certainly don't have a direct path from every device to every other device. Uh, both kinds of mesh are the most available structures because more nodes and cables can break and the remaining stuff can still talk to each other until you break an awful lot of it because of all the redundant paths. All right, so I got the first bunch of cahoots. This is a long class, and you got quite a few cahoots. Uh, this is 5B, and there it is. And there it is. All right. Seven digit cahoot numbers. One of my students discovered that there is a premium edition of Kahoot that lets you put your company logo on it. I wonder who's paying for all this. I like this, but I never paid him any money. And as an American, that troubles me. Anyway. <clears throat> I think we've got more people than that. Yeah, there could be up to six. So I'll wait maybe another 10 seconds and see if more people wish to join. All right, perhaps we only have four Kahooters. All right, four questions. All right, what 
problem occurs when cables are placed near fluorescent lights. That's it, electromagnetic interference. EMP is when you get close to nuclear weapons. That's different. All right. What's the most common type of Ethernet cable? All right. Unshielded twisted pair is the cheapest and most common. All right, which land system uses two fiber rings? All right, that's fitty. All right, good. And what's the physical topology used by Ethernet? All right, it is a star. All right. So Al is the winner. Let's go back to here and look at some more of this. That plus review stuff. All right, so WAN technologies to move the large distance across the phone network, essentially, there are various ways to do it. T1 lines are lines uh, that provide 1.5 megabits per second and could originally take transmit 23 or 24 voice telephone calls was their original purpose. But when they switched to data, they used that data uh, and rated it by megabits per second. A T3 line can move 45 megabits per second. And people, these are the T carriers, people leased to have a dedicated line from one location to another at a company. The European standard is similar, E1 and E3. They're a little bit faster, but serve essentially the same purpose. Sonnet is what you get if you want really large data transfer rates up to gigabits per second and thousands of dollars a month. These are synchronous optical networking and uh, you can get them if you need a lot of bandwidth. Frame relay was one of the many protocols used to uh, sell internet access from internet service providers. And the particular advantage of frame relay is you could sell a specific amount of bandwidth to one customer and it would limit them to that much and let the rest of the cable be used for other customers. That was called a virtual circuit. And I think this is a really old technology and on the way out, but it's still included in Net Plus and uh, CISSP, although I think it's now removed from the very latest CCNA certification. All right, made these permanent virtual circuits and switched virtual circuits with data link connection identifiers. X25 is even older. Uh, I don't see it very much. It was around in the 70s to the 90s. And ATM is still around. It lasts a long time. It has these fixed size 53 byte cells. It's very small, of course. And uh, let me see, I think I'm getting a uh, some kind of hiss here. Let me uh, mute folks in the code. I think uh, something's going wrong here. All right, maybe that's Oh, it's just my fan. Okay, good. All right, never mind. I thought it was perhaps going to irritate you folks, but I don't think it will. If you have an irritating noise or something, of course, send me a chat message or let me know. Anyway, this 53-byte cells have 48 bytes of data and 5 bytes of address, which sounds like a very small amount, but these things are still used and considered quite fast. Uh, Multi-protocol label switching is important because you can have multiple technologies going down the same wire. Um, like ATM and frame relay and so on, and a lot of uh, long-range connections use MPLS. SDLC and HDLC are other techniques used on the wide area network uh, to move data from one location to another. These are not things you would normally configure unless you are working essentially at an ISP. So HDLC has a normal response mode and an asynchronous response mode and an asynchronous and balanced mode, various ways to set it up. There are converged protocols. This is a big issue these days as people want to move voice, data, and video over the same Ethernet line. Um, most people are getting away from having multiple wires coming into the house and having just one wire that carries everything. 
DNP3 is another standard used mainly by the energy sector for their SCADA equipment, which controls industrial equipment. And this is used for the smart grid technology, which is for uh, part of the system, including smart meters, to control the allocation of electricity from a central location. So this has to be carried over TCP IP, and it has an IEEE number, 1815-2012. There are storage protocols used for storage arrays, like storage area networks, which are very important for data centers when you have too much data to store on an individual machine, which is very common in this age of big data and cloud service providers. Uh, one of the very popular protocols for that is fiber channel. Fiber channel is not particularly connected to fiber optics. It, the fiber they refer to here is just a lot of parallel lines connecting your devices that draws something that looks sort of like a cloth fiber. And it was once its own protocol, but the most common way to do it now is fiber channel over ethernet, where the physical network is ethernet, but the logical data transmission is fiber channel. Another one used is iSCSI, Internet Small Computer System Interface. Um, these things allow you to have block level file access over a network so you can connect and uh, use data storage devices as if they were directly connected to you as a hard drive. So fiber channel over ethernet uses a special cable and hardware, but that turned out to be expensive and annoying and most people use ethernet instead these days. And here's iSCSI that can be routed and allow you to have access over a wide area network to a storage network. There are virtual storage networks, um, which is like a virtual local area network where devices are in fact physically located in different buildings, but logically connected in some other way. Voice over IP is how almost all uh, voice transmissions happen these days. Most telephones are actually using IP. And this uses two protocols. Uh, the real-time transport protocol is what actually carries the audio and visual data. And session initiation protocol is what's used to ring the phone and tell if you picked it up and establish connection. So that's the control protocol. And the RTP actually has the data. There are issues with the quality of voice on voice over IP. It is usually quite a bit inferior to the voice that you get with an old fashioned copper line. So there are various techniques to try to improve it. And there's also an issue of confidentiality. Since your telephone calls are now traveling over the shared internet, they can be intercepted and wiretapped. So there are other protocols used to improve the accuracy of transmission and to add encryption to it. But in practice, many companies turn off the encryption on the telephone calls to get higher sound clarity. Anyway, voice over IP typically is cheaper than paying for long distance phone calls, at least it used to be. The main reason most companies move to it now is so they can have a lot of features on the phone, like forwarding the call to a third party and having automated systems that say press one for this and press two for that and so on. You can use Wireshark to pick up network traffic and play these, and we do that at the Wall of Sheep at DEF CON. Uh, people are stealing data off the wire, and one of the things they're doing is stealing voice over IP calls and listening to them through headphones to find out what people are saying. Software-defined networks are all the rage where you virtualize not only the computers, but you virtualize the network. So you have virtual switches and virtual routers and virtual uh, network traffic moving around, and so you now can uh, make adjust your uh, network in software. They're coming quite a ways. The well, most well-known protocol for that is OpenFlow, but there are others. So there are some cahoots about that stuff. And here I think you see something I mentioned before, that the CISSP is a mile wide and an inch deep. You know, like the top two or three facts about each of these terms, and that's really all you know to actually learn how to set any of it up or anything. So we're at 5B2. All right. And that will be here. There we go. All right. There we come. All right. 
could get up to seven people if everyone joins. There were five last time, so here comes four. Good. <coughs> I'll wait nearly 10 seconds to see if anyone else is coming. Three. All right, four questions. So which link carries 45 megs? Okay, it's a T3. Uh, a lot of people are mentioning ATM. ATM can go a lot faster, different speeds, but T3 is 45 megs. Uh, we are up to five people. Someone joined after I saw. All right, which one of these is a storage protocol? All right, fiber channel over Ethernet. Which protocol is used primarily by the energy sector? DNP3, okay. And what's the most well-known SDN protocol? Open flow, good. All right. So we're not even, a, we're just about a half hour in. I'll just keep going. All right. So wireless local area networks. Uh, one big issue about wireless networks is denial of service attacks. Um, an attacker can just put out radio noise or send deauthentication frames and uh, block people's connection to the wireless network, and there is no defense for this. It, it is uh, a problem with wireless networks that they are vulnerable to radio noise. Um, all right. There's a certain bands available. Most of the uh, radio frequencies are reserved for government and commercial use, but there are two common bands used, 2.4 gigahertz and 5 gigahertz, and that's where most computer data is sent. There are techniques used to employ these channels, frequency hopping spread spectrum hops from one channel to another, direct sequence spread spectrum uses many channels. The point of both of these is to minimize interference. This is the number one problem with wireless networks. So many devices are using these narrow channels that you're typically trying to communicate through a haze of noise from other devices, and these techniques are used to make that more efficient. Orthogonal frequency division multiplexing is like wavelength division multiplexing on fiber optic cables. It uses different radio frequencies that do not interfere with one another to move more data simultaneously. So here are the protocols. The original wireless network was 802.11. It was very old and slow and not very popular. The first really big hit was 802.11b, which became a commercial success. And after A came first and was faster, but it was shorter range, running at 5 gigahertz, and it didn't get very popular. B got popular, and then we have G, N, and AC as things go up. So, uh, all right. And then there's uh, some wireless network modes. There are four modes a wireless chip can operate in. A normal person only uses managed mode and nothing else, and most Windows drivers only let you use managed mode, because if you have a laptop, the only thing you want to do is obey the access point. The access point runs in master mode, so it sends out beacon frames over the wireless network, and the beacon frames say, here is the name of my network, here is my encryption, here is my data rate, obey these rules if you want to join my network. And your device in managed mode just says, yes, sir, I will do what you say. The other modes, um, ad hoc, is a mode you can use on a home device where you connect two devices just to transmit data point to point without being connected to the internet and the router. And monitor mode is a mode that some hardware allows you to 
to reach, but not most hardware, where you can sniff uh, wireless traffic that is not addressed to your NIC. This is something that typically a hacker does to spy on someone else's transmissions. Um, it doesn't have much practical use other than that. All right, and that's what we've got here. Managed and master mode are the only modes in a normal network. The router is in master mode and the clients are in managed mode. And to be fair, I should say the access point is in master mode. Ad hoc is peer to peer, like a crossover cable, and monitor is used to sniff traffic that is not addressed to you, um, not generally something a normal client would do. Your wireless um, beacon frames and all the other frames to communicate on the network have to carry this SSID, which is the name of the network. And many networks are sharing the same uh, geographical location, so this is how you separate them. You can disable SSID broadcasts in your router so that you will not appear in this list, and that might stop your neighbors from using your wireless network, but it is a considered a weak security measure because your uh, data trains when you're using a network are still broadcasting the SSID, and anybody can see that, so it's not, uh, it's not like you can really hide it very effectively. Another technique, which is a weak but common technique, is MAC address filtering, where you type in only certain MAC addresses that are allowed to use the network. This is another way to stop your neighbor from using your wireless device, but it's again very weak because if you don't have encryption turned on, you're sending plain text packets with your MAC address in them, and all that person has to do is sniff with Wireshark, and they can find out the MAC addresses that are approved and switch to one of them. WEP was the original wireless encryption technique that came out with 802.11b. Even without any complicated security analysis, average people were reluctant to use wireless networks because they intuitively said, this doesn't look safe. My data is just spraying all over the place. Sending it down a cable seems much safer. And indeed, that is true. So to comfort them, the uh, people in the industry that invented this thing called wired equivalent privacy to try to convince customers that the wireless signal was as safe as the signal going down a wire, and that was in fact not true at all. It was a very bad encryption system with serious mathematical flaws, and within a couple of years of it coming out, it was hacked and people found out how to totally break into a web network without the key. So it is now considered a um, very poor decision to use web unless you have to because you have old hardware that cannot speak any later protocol. 802.11i is the official technique to improve web encryption, and this is uh, marketed as WPA2, and this is considered very secure. It fixes all the cryptographic problems of web using modern techniques like AES encryption. WPA was a stopgap measure intended to make it possible to improve security from web with a software upgrade to hardware that was designed for web. So it um, uses temporal key integrity protocol to change the key, so packets use a different key each time, and a few other techniques to make WEP a little stronger. And people were, this was originally only expected to work for a few years before somebody would hack it, but in fact, nobody ever did find any serious flaws in it, and WPA is perfectly fine. However, on modern hardware, WPA2 actually runs faster, so w, it's generally preferred for performance over WPA, but there's no particular security problem with using either WPA or WPA2. They're both fine. Bluetooth is used for short range devices you would carry on your body, like a cell phone to an earpiece. The earlier tech uh, forms ran slower and had uh, poor encryption. There are modern versions of it that are faster and have good encryption. Uh, uses a stream cipher, and the early one was considered to be weak. So uh, I think there's a more modern version that came out later that is stronger than this. All right, radio frequency identification are these tags you see in um, tickets uh, to get into places. I think they're in also in your car to electronic tolls. And so there are active RFID tags with a battery and there are passive ones that are powered by the reader that are more common and cheaper. And those serve essentially the same purpose as scannable barcodes to just read something like a passport as you go past your device. Uh, all these radio signals can be a privacy risk 
And so if you don't want any of this stuff happening, for example, if you are a cop and you have impounded a cell phone at a crime scene, you want to make sure that the cell phone will not get any traffic. So you could put it in airplane mode, but if you can't do that, you put it in a paint can or some other Faraday cage. You put it in a, a metal box of some sort so no radio signals can get at it. <coughs> All right. So there are some cahoots about that. This is number three. All right. Uh, I don't see any comments. Good. I hope that means things are working. Good. There come the people. Uh, there's five people. Good. I'll wait and, ah, six people. Ah, good, good. Now, theoretically, we could have up to seven, but six is the most I've seen today. Let's carry on. Okay, four questions. So if you connect two devices together, like a crossover cable, what mode are you using? A couple of typos in my questions, not too serious. All right, they call that ad hoc. All right, if you use simultaneous transmissions that do not interfere with each other, which of these are you using? That is orthogonal frequency division multiplexing. The SSID is the service set identifier. That's just the name of the network. All right. Which standard runs on five gigahertz? All right, that's A. A runs on five only. B and G run on two and a half only, and N uses both two and a half and five. All right, so which technology will block radio signals? A Faraday cage? Just put yourself in a metal box. So Al is the winner again. All right. So, secure network devices and protocols. Um, repeaters were the first layer one device to just move a, a signal down a longer cable because the attenuation weakened it too much. Those are not that common anymore, but hubs are still around. Hubs are multi-part repeaters. So you plug all the devices into an ethernet cable, connect it to a hub, and if any one device sends a signal, the hub sends it to all the other devices because the hub is a layer one device. It pays no attention to any addresses. All it does is make a copy of every packet, that, every frame that comes in and send it to every other device bit by bit without understanding it. Bridges are devices to connect two networks together. And these are also not common anymore, but they were would connect two networks and they would learn which MAC addresses are on which side and only forward things that are really trying to cross from one network to another. A switch is what became the most popular device by far at this of the, among all these four. This is the multi-port bridge. So a switch, you can connect many devices to it and every time it receives a frame, it remembers the source MAC address and adds it to an internal table called a switching table and now it knows where that device is, and when it gets frames addressed to it, it knows which wire to send it down. So after the first few fractions of a second, when you turn on a network, the switch learns all the MAC addresses and thereafter sends traffic only where it should go and does not send it all over the place where it's going to collide and be eavesdrops upon and so on. VLANs are the next step up. Smarter switches like enterprise class switches can do this where you can choose 
some of the physical devices connected to one switch and call them one VLAN, and some of them and call them another VLAN, so you can create a logical separation of devices into virtual local area networks, which are not connected to the physical local area networks. So you could have all the accountant people in one building on the same local area network as the accountant is in another building, but separated from people who are not accountants, but happen to be in the same building. This is very valuable for both security and performance, and almost everybody's using it. Port isolation is another issue. Um, you might want to limit when devices are able to plug in to a port. So uh, another thing you do here is you don't, you um, limit what ports are allowed to do what. Only one port is allowed to manage the device, only one port is allowed to go to the next layer up, and so on. This way, if an attacker manages to compromise a machine, or they manage to plug into a network port and connect, they will not find all the privileges they want to have. It creates more of a maze for intruders to wander through to uh, get to high privileged devices on your network. All right, um, it would be nice to separate devices from one another too. Uh, many cloud providers, if you rent a virtual machine, you're actually just stuck in the same switch with a bunch of other customers and their traffic can actually interfere with your traffic. Um, it would be better to isolate them from each other. The span port is a special port that makes an extra copy of every packet passing through a switch for the purpose of network security monitoring. It's also called a mirror port. Um, this, of course, only works if the total traffic passing through the switch is not exceeding the ability of this one port to carry it, which can happen. Network taps are a superior way to perform network security monitoring. You buy a special hardware device and connect it to some part of your network and it makes an extra copy in hardware of all the traffic passing through, so you are more likely to capture all the traffic for your network security monitor. Routers carry traffic from one network to another network by removing the MAC addresses and re-encapsulating it with different MAC addresses to reach the other network. That's called a hop decreases the TTL by one, and uh, usually if you communicate with a server somewhere else, you're going through 10 or 20 or 30 hops to get there. Um, now there were originally just static routes where a network manager would have to type in the routes, telling it uh, where you're going. This is what home users typically have. They only have one route called the default gateway. There is one route for everything that's not local. Uh, small companies can still use manual static routes, but most people prefer to have dynamic routing. So here, if you have a home network um, or a small business, you'll have uh, addresses like 192.168 on your stations. And one of the stations, A, is the router. So it actually has two addresses, 192.168 type address to communicate on the LAN, and another address here, 147.144, to go to the WAN. And it has, since it knows it's a router, it's got packet forwarding turned on. So stations B, C, and D send their internet traffic to A, which uh, routes that traffic to the internet by changing its MAC addresses and sending it off to the internet service provider. If your company is large or changing, then you would like to have a dynamic routing protocol. Another issue is, if you see this network on the right here, Suppose one of these links goes down, one of these T1s or T3s, then you would like to reroute traffic to go through the remaining good links. So this is called dynamic routing, when routers talk to each other and say where they can go and how they can get there, and it is called the convergence time of a network. It says how long it takes for it to heal around a break, how long before all the routing tables update and traffic flows smoothly again. There are interior gateway protocols and exterior gateway protocols used for routers to exchange information about their ability to route packets. Inside companies, you use interior gateway protocols, and the two covered by the uh, CISSP exam are RIP and OSPF. The only external gateway protocol of any importance is BGP, Border Gateway Protocol, used to route across the internet. <coughs> so, Distance vector routing protocols 
are what RIP uses, and it is very simple. This dates from a very long time ago when routers were very weak. They had very little memory and very little processing. So all they would do is know how many hops and which port to go. So it might know AT&T is two hops out port one, and CCSF is three hops out port two, and that's all they know. They don't really know what path the packets are taking. They just know which direction to go, like a sign that might say Paris this way and New York that way. Uh, this, as you can imagine, it can be inefficient and it can even lead to sending packets the wrong way because you don't really have as much information as you might want to have. And RIP, which did this, uh, would often have routing loops where it gets confused and sends packets the wrong way so the packets go back and forth or even around in loops. And this is why you have the TTL in the IP header, because it is a real situation that your packets might just go around in a circle and you have to throw them away to avoid cluttering up the internet with lost packets. The routing information protocol is very old. It's not very efficient. It was designed for very weak routers. And uh, it sends updates every 30 seconds, whether they need to go or not, which is part of why it gets things wrong, because sometimes you have new information come in and an old copy of old information comes in later and overwrites it, so you end up with the wrong information. Anyway, RIP version one was for classful networks only, A, B, and C, which we covered a couple of weeks ago. Uh, RIP version two supports this classless interdomain routing where you can have the slash number and various different sizes of networks. So in order to prevent routing loops, RIP had a split horizon, so it will not echo a route back to the router that originated it to try to prevent routing updates from going foolish places and giving people old data. There's a poison reverse to mark when routes are known to be bad, so you quit sending data that way. And a hold down timer, which waits before changing a route for 180 seconds. And the idea is, hopefully, when you have a new route, you refuse to change it for a while, so hopefully all those echoes of old updates have passed and you're not going to accidentally update it from old information. As you can see, this is going to delay the convergence time and RIP does suffer from a high convergence time. It can spend several minutes in a state where it's sending packets around in a loop or the wrong direction. So the improvement is to go to a link state routing protocol if you have more powerful hardware and the router has enough RAM to actually keep the entire network diagram in the router. Now it doesn't know just how many hops and which direction to send things. It actually knows what links are there and whether each link is up or down. So when a link goes down, it can make an intelligent decision about where to send the packet. So it's much better than RIP and it works fine on modern hardware. And that's OSPF is the open source um, link state routing protocol. Uh, excuse me. Yeah, link state routing protocol it has the entire uh, network in it. And this converges much faster than RIP. Uh, so typically these days you only use RIP for very small networks, like maybe four routers. And if you have anything more complicated than that, you use OSPF or you use proprietary protocols like Cisco's EIGRP, which converge even faster, but they're not covered by the CISSP exam, which tries to avoid proprietary technology. BGP is the protocol used once you go out of your company network up to the internet. It's used by the internet service providers and the very large companies to route between autonomous systems on the internet. And this is called a path vector protocol. It counts distance not by hops, but by the number of companies you pass through. So if you go through AT&T and then Comcast and Verizon, that's three hops. But if you get, go directly to Verizon, that's one hop. All right. There's... Uh, some cahoots about that. Let's see, get rid of this. And we're up to number four. All right. All right, five people. I think we got up to six last, there we are, six. Good, I'll wait another five seconds. 
I think that's it. All right, four questions. So which device is it OSI layer three? Okay, that's a router, of course, good. And which device moves packets from a LAN to the internet? All right, it's a router. I wondered if people would uh, doubt that it could be the same thing twice, but that's a router. All right. All right, uh, what protocol uses hop count as a metric? That's RIP, which by the way is kind of crazy. So if you had two T1 lines, they call that two hops, but one 56K line would be considered one hop and better. Anyway, it was uh, not that common, not a very efficient protocol. All right, which LAN routing protocol converges rapidly? All right, and it's OSPF there. BGP is a exterior protocol. Interior would be a better word than LAN, but the routing protocol you can use inside your company network is OSPF. Some people actually use BGP inside their company networks, but it is very complicated, and that's only the very largest companies that would do a thing like that. So Al is the winner again. Now we're almost up to an hour, and there's two more sections. What I think I'm gonna do is one more section of this and then quit because the next lecture is pretty short. So we can do the last section of this one and the next lecture easily in an hour next time. And I think that'll probably work out better. So anyway, one more section of these. All right, so firewalls. There are quite a few different kinds of firewalls. The layer one firewall was the packet filter that just takes each packet and looks at the headers, looks at the IP addresses and the port numbers to decide whether to keep that packet. This was a stateless firewall. It did not remember anything about the past. Each packet has to be considered in isolation. So there are conditions under which you can trick it and have a packet go through that shouldn't go through. For example, ACK packets always have to go through because for all the firewall knows, ACK packets are part of a TCP data exchange that's in progress. Stateful firewalls have a state table, so they know the history. They know if someone has made a TCP handshake and they have an established TCP session and they are sending data, so they have a more intelligent ability to tell whether to let something through like an ACK packet, but that means the firewall is working a bit more to move the data. A proxy firewall intercepts all transmission and, and then gets it on your behalf. So if you want to get to the internet, you say, I want to connect to the bank. Well, it says, well, I will connect to the bank and fetch the data and pass it to you. So the bank never has any direct connection with you at all. It's in the middle. There are application layer proxy firewalls that can use application layer data to filter traffic. We have this at City College. Uh, BitTorrent is a problem for many networks because people use up a lot of bandwidth and they downloaded copyrighted stuff and make trouble for everybody. So we would like to block it. But BitTorrent clients are sneaky and they will keep changing the port they use. So we have a layer seven firewall that blocks the BitTorrent protocol no matter what port it's on. So this is a smarter firewall that looks at the entire packet to deduce what it is and does not look just at the IP and TCP header. There are circuit level proxies that operate at layer five. The most common one is a SOX proxy. This can forward many protocols and the most common use of it that I know is TOR, the anonymity network, the onion router, this is used by people to access hidden services because they're doing something illegal or because they have some other reason to want a high degree of privacy. For example, they are engaged in political protest against a repressive government, so they want to hide where they are, and that data is sent through a layer five proxy, a SOX proxy. 
if you set up a network, you have a secure part of the network and you have an untrusted internet, so you typically have one specially hardened server called the bastion host, which is the gateway into your network, and this is a device set to be more secure than other devices because you know it's going to be constantly under attack. You also often have dual homed hosts that connect two networks together, so you have uh, two IP addresses on this device, and it can therefore um, handle the distribution of traffic from one device to another. There's also a thing called a screen host, where you use a router that forces all traffic to go to the bastion host, and uh, this is another arrangement, and not considered very desirable because if the bastion host fails, traffic goes directly in without being filtered. In any case, you usually have a DMZ. You have layers of different trust in your network. So you have the internet on the left where anything can happen, and you have a firewall here that does minimal screening, and then when the email, web server, and FTP server are exposed to lightly filtered traffic from the internet, but your trusted network on the inside is filtered again to try to remove the attacks, and typically you only let people in there after they have authenticated and proven that they really are company employees, uh, whereas you probably want the whole world to see your web server and email server, so you call this semi-trusted network a DMZ. And usually networks are far more complicated than this. I know my college has 100 VLANs of different trust levels, and that is quite common. You can make a DMZ with one firewall if you like, a firewall that can have two set of rules, a permissive set of rules to let most traffic into the DMZ and a much more restrictive set of rules to only let uh, known good traffic into the trusted network. A modem is something that translates digital data into another signal that can go down some other kind of network. The original kind sent audio signals down a copper telephone line there are also DSL modems and such, and cable modems that just change the electrical properties of the signal so it'll travel down a different medium. Uh, the data terminal equipment is the end device, like a laptop or a phone, and the data circuit terminating equipment is the other end of a network. Uh, this is ISP technology, and ISP technology is typically serial, point to point, and the two ends are not the same. The D mark is the legal point at which the DCE meets the DTE. This is where the internet service provider's responsibility ends. If you pay a monthly bill for internet service, they do not provide internet service to your computers. They just provide it to a box on the wall someplace in your building, and it is your responsibility to distribute it from there. Uh, so the CSU, DSU is a... Uh, technology used for serial links that uses a clock signal provided by one end of it, uh, and this is typically what's really happening up in the internet service provider. All right, then there are other um, protocols for security here to move security information around. There have been many generations of protocols. The first thing was password authentication protocol that just sends passwords directly over the wire, and this was appropriate long before the internet when you would just have a terminal running down a wire to a computer in one room which you own and nobody else has access to, that would be fine. But now that these signals are being sent over a shared internet, this is a very bad idea because other people can receive those packets and read your password, of course. So the first step up is challenge a handshake authentication protocol, where instead of sending a password directly to the server, the server sends you a challenge, which is a few extra characters. You add that to your password and hash it, and then send the hash over the network. The server can take the stored password and, can, and add the challenge and hash it there, and therefore recognize the hash, which proves that you know the password, but the thing that was sent over the wire is not equal to your password. So this is more secure but it does require plain text storage of the password on the server because so if the server gets hacked, people can steal a database of passwords off it and that's not very good. 8021X is a protocol to give you port-based access control so you can limit who's coming in the various ways into your network. Um, the person trying to connect is called a supplicant. They then connect to an authentication server that receives some kind of credentials and the authenticator is a device that decides whether those credentials are approved or not. 
So here you have on the bottom left the supplicant. It comes in and asks the authenticator. The authenticator says, well, you have to pass me something like a password hash or a certificate. It then passes it over to the authentication server, which is typically Radius, which tells the authenticator whether this is approved or not. And only after you're approved, do you then get access to the internal network. So there are different types of EAP used in this system, extensible authentication protocol. EAP MD5 was a simple one using MD5 hashing. Leap was another one Cisco invented to try to improve the poor security of WEP. It turned out to not be very good, and it got hacked by Joshua Wright with a tool called Asleep. Um, it's subject to an offline dictionary attack and not very good. It's a little better than WEP, but not very good. EAP Fast was designed by Cisco to replace Leap, and that's considered reasonably secure. There are other ones. EAP TLS uses transport layer security uh, with public key infrastructure like HTTPS, which is considered quite secure, but it's costly because you have to have certificates both on the client and the server side. Uh, EAP TTLS is a tunneled transport layer security that allows your client to use a password instead of a certificate, so it is easier to deploy, but perhaps less secure. PEEP is protected EAP, similar to TTLS. I think it's a Microsoft technology and considered pretty good, and you only need certificates on the server. So I got some cahoots about that stuff. And this is the last bit we'll do today. So it is number five. And here it is. There we go. There we go. I think we got up to seven players last time. So I'll wait a few more seconds. Five seconds, aha, there's six, another five seconds. I think there's one more player. Well, perhaps not, but I think they can join later. All right, four questions. So what's the firewall that uses only the header information? All right, that's the simplest generation one, a packet filter. That's what it's called. All right, which device is at OSI layer five? Okay, that's a SOX proxy. All right, which system provides port-based network access control? All right, that is 8021X. It can be as simple as just restricting the MAC addresses that are allowed to plug into a uh, ethernet jacket uh, socket, but it's typically more complicated than that. All right, which system is vulnerable and should be avoided? Leap. Leap was the old Cisco protocol that turned out to not be much good and was replaced by a stronger one. All right, so Al is the winner again. We've been here about an hour, and I think that's all we need. So next week, 
we will finish this up and do the next chapter. If anybody got any questions, I hope you have not been shy about bringing them up. I'll wait a minute or so to see if anything comes in, and then I'll shut down the session to post the recording. Have a good week. I'll quit at 7.05.30. All right. Farewell.